Hey, what is going on everyone? Hey, okay, another video coming your way, and this one is gonna be a, a little different than normal, all right? So this is actually going to be a Matthew chapter seven uh, study into this chapter, okay? So now I'm not gonna take the entire chapter and go through the entire chapter, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a chunk, a big chunk of this chapter in verses 13 all the way to 23, and, and quite possibly chapter verses 13 all the way to uh, verse 29 and and really flesh these verses out, flesh uh, what Jesus is talking about with the narrow way, what, what he's talking about when he says, you will know them by their fruit, what he's talking about when he says, I never knew you, and, and, and even building it on the rock. So there's a lot in this this chapter here, and there's a lot that we're going to be covering. So it's going to be a little Matthew, it's going to be a small little Matthew series that we're going to do. And we're going to start today in verses 13 through 14. Okay, so before we get into that, I kind of want to give you a background of, of what, where these verses are coming from, what, what the whole thing's about. Okay, so in Matthew chapter 7, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount that we know about in Scripture that Jesus preaches from. And, and it starts in Matthew chapter 5. And so uh, some people kind of debate whether or not this is Jesus speaking to strictly his disciples only or to the crowds only or to a mixture of both, the disciples and the crowds. And so when we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, Scripture lets us know who the main audience is. But when we read in Matthew chapter 7, I believe it's uh, verse 28... Yeah, 28, we see who else gets involved in this sermon on the mount. So Matthew chapter 5 says in verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Okay, so then he opened his mouth and taught them. Okay, so we see that Jesus sees the multitudes. Well, Jesus sees the multitudes, and then he leaves up to the mountain. Okay, so when he goes up to the mountain, his disciples came with him. It doesn't say anything about the crowds, the multitude of the crowds coming as well. So we just see Jesus going up to the mountain and his disciples have followed him. Now, quick thing, we need to understand that these disciples that are mentioned here, it's not talking about the the well-known, the famous 12 disciples that Jesus chooses, because we see that Jesus chooses those 12 coming in chapter 10, all right? So in chapter 10 is when he starts calling his 12 disciples. And so these disciples that Jesus is talking about here, it could be five people, it could be 12 disciples, it could be 100, it could be 50, it could be thousands. I mean, we don't know. Scripture doesn't get specific with it. So all it does right here is, it separates the crowds from the disciples because the disciples are those who are followers of Christ who, you know, the crowds are those who are just kind of peering in just to listen and, and who are still skeptical possibly or, or whatnot. But then in verse, in chapter 7, verse 28, we, we do see that the crowds do eventually join in at some point. It says, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teachings okay so i'm reading from the new king james version a lot of, of other versions will say the crowd people and crowd when we look at the original text it's meaning the same thing here okay so don't let that trick you or anything so at some point here we see that the crowds are astonished that the crowds are amazed at his teachings okay so at some point through chapter five and seven we're seeing here that yes, at first he's speaking to the disciples, but at some point, the crowds do find Jesus and the disciples there and start listening in as well. So um, anyways, I just want to give you that layout so you had that idea before we get into this study here. All right, so like I said, we're going to focus in, we're going to key in to verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7 in Matthew. And, and from there, the next video that comes out will be over whatever else, if I want to tackle just 15 and 16 or, or more verses after that. Uh, but I, I want to take this slow and steady, and I want to make sure to give out as much good 
biblical insight into these uh, verses here, this, this chapter that we're taking. And so verse 13 starts off by saying, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. All right, so when when reading this verse here, these verses here, Jesus is being very specific. And he's warning people. He's letting the people listening know that the way into heaven is narrow and difficult, okay? And the way that leads to hell, the lake of fire, is broad and many will go in by it. And when we read that, this can really overwhelm people and say, and, and lead people to say, well, Jesus, if you're so loving, if you're so good, why would you make heaven, the entrance way into heaven, narrow and difficult? And then the way to hell so broad and easy? And and that's that's a question that many will ask. Many unconverted people will ask that question. We'll, we'll try and get Christians in the corner with that question. But as Christians, let's let's know our word, okay? And, and let's let the Holy Spirit, as Scripture talks about, speak through us when times like that. All right? So we'll flip over. We can flip over to Romans chapter, uh, I believe it's 8 or 9. And when we flip over to that, you can give anybody who asks you that question, uh, how can God make the gate to heaven so narrow and broad and why doesn't he just let everybody into heaven if he's so loving well you can give him this response just like paul says to the people who question the way that god has made salvation you can tell them this in verse in chapter 9 verse 20 paul tells the people and you can tell the the people who asked you that question the same thing but indeed O oh man who are you to reply against God. All right, so who are you to reply against God? Who are you to question the way God does things and has chosen to do things? So that's a, that's a great response to give somebody, but I would also encourage you that you would give them even more response than just who are you, oh man, to reply against God? Who are you, oh man, to question in the way that God does things because he is God. He is the creator of the universe and you are just a mere man. So it's good to remind people that, that of that truth. But also remind them of this because this is, this is the beauty of the scriptures that intertwine like lace. They don't contradict one another. The, the verses here, the scriptures here do not contradict. God's word is true and good. And so we have enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. So we have to be faithful brothers and sisters in Christ when talking to lost people, when, when telling people who are lost, who are, who are asking about this verse, who, who have questions about this verse, who, are, who we are evangelizing this verse to. We have to tell them two important things. One, about the difficult way of a Christian life. And two, of how faithful and gracious God is and merciful. And how loving he is to give us a way into it. Okay? So one we're going to tackle is the narrow and difficult way that leads to life. We see all throughout scripture. All from Old to New Testament. Countless countless examples in the scriptures about how difficult the Christian life is. It is not something that just someone, you know, goes, walks the aisle, repeats some prayer, or sitting with you and the pastor has them repeat a prayer after them, and they just go on with their life. That is not the Christian life, okay? The Christian life is going to be a life of difficulty, of challenge, 
It's not something that's going to be merely easy, all right? And we see Jesus warning us. I mean, flip over, if we flip over to, uh, let's see, Matthew, um, Matthew 19, let's see, 16 through 22. We see the rich young ruler here. All right? He's got everything he has. And he's telling Jesus, I've, I, I have kept all the commands that you have laid before us. But what does Jesus go to? What, what does Jesus tell him? If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And the young man heard these sayings, and he went away sorrowful, because he had great possessions. So, so you're going to have to give things up to follow Christ. You're going to have to give up your your man-made idols. The things that you have put above Christ, you will have to give up for his sake. And this rich young man's ruler, obviously his, his thing was his possessions. It's not everybody's sin that they have to give up. That's not everybody's you know, thing, idol that they have created, that they have given up. But it could be yours. And this rich young ruler was not able to give up his possessions for Christ's sake, follow after him. And because of that, the Lord made it clear to him, hey, without that, you will not have treasure in heaven. You will not be in heaven. We see that clearly here, and we see the rich young ruler just walk away sorrowful, not repented, not saying, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Well then, if you read more in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, it tells us, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. This Christian walk, this Christian life is so hard. I mean, let's see if we can, I can, I can pull it up real quick for us. I mean, we, we, we think about the seed sowed on the, on the ground. Let me, uh, let me see. When, when we see that... Flip over to John. Um, let's see the seed sowed. Could be in Luke or yeah, it could be actually in Luke. Let's see here. In Mark, the the parable of the sower. So we, we see that Jesus taught them many things in the parables and said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out and sowed it, and it happened as he sowed, that some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds of the air came up and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth from, of earth. But when the sun was up and it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew, and it choked it up, and yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground, and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and some hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears, let them hear. And, and so, those who endure to the end, those who endure this Christian walk to the end will be saved. It is challenging. It is there are things that we're going to have to give up. And, and he goes on and explains what the parable of the sower means. And so later in, in, in Mark chapter 4, verse 13, he says, And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand the parables? The sower sows the word. So, so we know the, the word that is sowed. The sower sows the word. So when the word has been proclaimed, when the gospel has been proclaimed, that is, that is the word being sowed into a person. And these are the ones by the way where the word is sowed. When they hear, Satan comes and immediately takes away the word that was sowed in their hearts. These likewise are the ones who sow on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have, a, have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation and persecution arise, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. 
And now these are the ones who sowed among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things entice them and choke the world, the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones who sow on the ground. Those who hear the word accept it and bear fruit for 34, some 64, and some 100. And, and so we see how beautiful that is. Those who endure to the end, those who have heard the word, who, who, who the seed has been sowed on good ground, will accept it and bear fruit. And those will produce 30-fold, some 60-fold, and 100-fold. Th those, those who hear that on good ground, those who the, the word has been sowed on good ground, will endure to the end. What, what else do we see here? Uh, Luke. Let's see. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. It, it talks it's talking about the cost of discipleship. And this one really puts it in perspective for us. Now it happened as they journeyed, and this is Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. It says, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that some said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. So you've got some who say, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And what does Jesus tell them? Jesus says to them, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So Jesus is telling these people, Hey, you want to follow me? Okay, great. I have nowhere to lay my head at night. You still want to follow me? The birds have a place to sleep. Foxes do as well. The Son of Man, God in the flesh, has nowhere to lay his head at night. You still want to come? Then he said to another, so Jesus then tells somebody else, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first. Let me first go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. That's, that's, that's hard. And there could be a study that we can do in that. And I'd actually love to do that in the future about what that means. But we just don't have the time right now. And so, what does Jesus go and preach the kingdom of God? Verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid my farewell who are at my house. Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one who puts their hand to the plow and is looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I mean, Jesus is saying some hard words here. And like I said, I actually love to do a study just in these verses here from 57 through 62 in Luke chapter 9 because I think that would be really, really good. But again, we do all the time for this and that moment. And then lastly, John chapter 6, verse 6 through 71. I'm not going to read all these verses, but... We see here, right before these verses, Jesus is talking about something so difficult. And what does it say? It says many of his disciples turned away. It was These things were hard for them. So they turned away. They walked away from Christ. They said, I, I can't do this. I, I, this, isn't, this, is, I, this is too challenging. This isn't for me. And so he had all these disciples... Because just because you're a disciple doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you're a disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't mean you're a true follower of him. And well, who is he left with? He's left with the twelve. So I, I love this because after all the disciples leave, Jesus then turns to his disciples. The 12 that are left, the famous 12 that are left. And he says to them, do you also go away? In verse 67, he says that. I love what Simon Peter says. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I love that. 
I mean, when when this Christian walk gets difficult and challenging, I would urge you, urge you, beg you, be reminded of what Simon where are we going to go, Lord? You hold the words of eternal life. No matter how difficult and challenging and no matter what persecution I face no matter what hate I get because of following you, because of calling you Christ the Messiah, Lord of my life, because I'm not willing to indulge in what the world has to offer, Lord, but I'm willing to indulge in all of you, what you have to offer me, Lord. When we have those views and it gets difficult and challenging, I would urge you, say and be reminded of what Simon Peter says here to the Lord when the Lord says, "Do you are you going to leave too? So in those moments when when you're wrestling, when you're, you're having a very tough Christian walk, Lord, because it's going to happen, you have to endure those times. And when you fail and when you fall and when you sin... You get back up because a righteous man does just that. He doesn't stay in his muck, dirt. He gets out of it because the Lord brings him out of it. And you look at the Lord and you say, Lord, where am I going to go? You hold the words of eternal life. What a beautiful, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful heart to have to the Lord in that moment. And so as we read on, I could go honestly on and on about the scriptures talking about how difficult it is to to be a true Christian, to have truly put your faith in Christ and Him alone. It is difficult, and Jesus warns us. There's other scriptures that talk about when Jesus says, hey, does a builder not first look at what he's building and look at it all before he builds it? Because if he doesn't, then he gets halfway done and realizes he can't finish it. Same thing with the Christian walk. I mean, it warns us in the scriptures of this difficulty. And it, you have to read that. You have to look at that. You have to see that. Because what good is it if your, your seed sowed and you're that stony or thorny ground but as much as the scriptures tell us tells us how difficult the Christian walk is what a beautiful thing to know that Jesus also will never turn down a true repented heart that desires and longs to be saved I don't know, how can I say that? How can I make that, that claim? Well, simply put, there's, I'll read a few verses to you. And this is, again, how the scriptures intertwine like lace. We're, we're going to see it here in these verses. They're going to intertwine beautifully. So remember those verses I just spat off to you and, and, and told you about how difficult the Christian walk is. But also remember, and remember how... Jesus makes, this, makes it known. Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, that leads to heaven. Keep those in your mind. For those who say, oh, how could God not just let everybody in? Respond with, with what Paul said in Romans. Oh, man, who are you to reply against God? But also respond with these verses too after giving them the difficult way. Let them know. We'll look at verse 7. And eight, right above verses 13 and 14 in chapter 7 of Matthew. What do those verses say? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If you desire and long to know Christ and Him crucified, you want to have eternal security, in your soul, that you die, you won't be in the lake of fire in hell forever and ever, but you'll be in glory with the Lord in heaven. Will there be no more suffering, no more pain? Will He wipe away every single of our tears? Ask, 
What does the scripture say here in verse 7? Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone, everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Jesus doesn't say, oh, only you know, uh, certain people will be able to. No, everyone, anybody who asks. But that's the thing. Man is wicked and evil and dead in their trespasses and sin and has no desire to come to the Lord apart from Him working in that person, breathing life into that dead body. What we see here, everyone who asks and receives. So ask. If you're listening to this message and you don't, Christ and Him crucified. And you're like, man, I, I want this. I'm, I'm tired of going to the world. I'm, I'm tired of running to the world for my satisfaction because it leaves me empty. Christ is welcoming you with arms wide open. And we see that more in verses in, in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. All time favorite scriptures, passages in scripture. It says, and in Matthew eleven twenty eight through thirty, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden light. What a beautiful promise from the Lord. What a beautiful love that we see here the lord welcoming come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest for your soul your soul john 3:16 everybody knows this verse for god so loved the world i mean everybody knows john 3:16 and they hear it so much that I think they just kind of tune it out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever. The, the, the gate is there. The narrow, difficult path is there waiting for you to enter into. Ask. Knock. Seek. For that rest for your soul and everyone everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life and 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 lastly romans 10 9 i've I, in my videos I, i've read a couple of these verses over and over again i always seem to go to them but romans 10 9 another beautiful promise that if you confess with your mouth that the lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Say, uh, well, only people, if they do that, will do No, it says if you do that, you will be saved. But there's so much more to these verses. Again, like I said, the Christian walk, the Christian life, to be one who is truly saved is not one that just walks in on repeats a prayer after their pastor and just goes home as if nothing has changed. I'll say it again and I'll say it as best I can. Guys, a true Christian would be like somebody who got hit by an 18-wheeler. Paul Washer gave this example and it's as if you're going out to dinner with a friend and when you're late, you're running late and your friend's waiting for you and it's been 40 minutes. And you come into the restaurant looking fine, looking normal. You walk in, you sit down, you order a glass of water and your friend's looking at you like, hey, uh, you know, I've been waiting here, dude, for, for 40 minutes, bro. Like, where are you at? Where you been? And then you look at them straight in the face. As as get out, oh, sorry, man. Uh, I, I was driving here. My tire blew out. I had to fix it on the highway. One of my lug nuts walk, walked off, you know, rolled off to the middle of the highway. 
and an 18 wheeler came and just going you know 75 smashed me right into me and uh got up got the lug nut put it back on the the, the new tire and the new rim and then just got here your friend would look at you like you're a liar or two mentally something is not like what's going on here The same would apply to being a Christian. If you're going to tell people that you're a Christian, if you're going to tell people that you're saved and that you're, you're, you're secure in your eternity, praise God, but please think about that, that example that I just gave. If there's no life change in how your walk with the Lord is, you may need to reevaluate and examine yourself as the scriptures say and read First John. So don't don't take these verses that I've given and be like, oh, okay, yeah, all it takes is just me to repeat a prayer, or okay, cool, I believe Jesus died on the cross, and then just walk away and live your life however you want. No, don't be fooled. You won't be. That's not being truly saved. Those who are truly saved will, will be born again. Will have a heart of stone taken out and put in a heart of flesh, and, and they will have the Holy Spirit inside of them, and they will begin to live life glorifying and honoring the Lord, not to earn righteousness, but because they've been made new. And now they have the Holy Spirit inside them, and they'll be convicted of sin, and they will be repented of their sin. And so, I, guys, again, I, I, I'm, I'm, my goal is to, to go through this study and uh, really just focus in on these verses here in chapter 7. It's obviously the entire chapter, a um, good chunk of the chapter, and uh, I pray that this would be a blessing to you, this would encourage you, that this would, would help you in your walk with the Lord, and uh, that it would bring about biblical salvations, that, that this would bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, as Scripture talks about, for those listening. And so, thank you for listening. Uh, if you guys need prayer for anything, my wife and I, for the BTT ministry, would love to to pray with you, pray for you. Um, if you have a Bible, uh, let my wife and I know, and we would love to send one your way. If you have questions about this video, questions about this study and, and where this is going, uh, let my wife and I know together in a message, and, and we would love to talk to you about this, all right? So thank you again for listening. Uh, again, I pray that this would be a blessing to you, an encouragement to you, and also, uh, if, if you're watching this video to the end, I would ask, hey, please um, consider, if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to the BT Team Ministry YouTube page. I'd be so thankful for that, just to get more people seeing this, this message and seeing the messages as well that are all on that YouTube channel of the BT Team Ministry. And if you're watching this video from Facebook, uh, I would ask that you would consider liking, sharing, commenting, getting this message out to uh, friends that I don't have on my Facebook, but that you do, uh, that you would think need to hear this message, and uh, you would love for them to uh, to see this message. It'd be a blessing, all right? And uh, another thing, my wife and I have created a patron account. Uh, we don't do this ministry for money, uh, but we have given people the option, if they've been blessed by this ministry in these videos, uh, that they have uh, four monthly giving options that they can do uh, in partnering with this ministry. And uh, you're, when you go to that Patreon account, I'll attach links of all this stuff uh, to the video. Uh, when you go to that account, you're going to see exactly where your money is going to. It's going to the ministry, the BT Team Ministry, um, just in different areas. So check it out, give it a look, and uh, you have that option if you would like to. But above... The, the giving financially, above the sharing, liking, and commenting, uh, above subscribing to the YouTube channel. Guys, my wife and I would just really ask that um, you would be praying for us, okay? Praying for this ministry, praying that, that Christ would be glorified, that, that the name of Jesus would be lifted high, and that we, my wife and I, would be would put low, and the ministry would be put low, and that he would be exalted over all those things. And uh, that his name would just be magnified. And that people would, would become, through this ministry, people would come to know the Lord. And, 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 and go before him 
just like we read in the scriptures today, and asking and seeking and knocking for salvation. All right? So thank you for listening. Thank you uh, for all that you do. And I pray that this message be a blessing. All right? Have a good day.